This is Brother Ron, and welcome to We All Be News Radio and TV, the news free Dixie for the 21st century. Judge, are you there? Yes, sir. Now, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing all right. I hope you are doing as well. I am just trying to survive this hot weather outside, trying to stay indoors as much as possible. <laughs> or we'll have a car with AC on. <laughs> it's crazy. Warm, isn't it? Yes, sir. Well, we all be under heaven once again, the one and only, the Honorable Judge Joe Brown. He's going to tell us what's going down in your town and beyond. So much to talk about. So little time. How you doing? You say you're doing great, Judge. I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. All right. Excellent. Well, what's going on? Like, there's so much to talk about. I just want to get your take first and foremost on the uh, the travel ban that was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court for the Muslim travel ban. What is your take well, on Well, let's cut beyond what the media has said in large part. Mm -hmm. To begin with, let's divorce the actual ban as it's written from what Trump said. What the ban has in it is not exclusively limited to Islamic countries. There are non-Islamic locales and points of origin that are banned in that right. All of the Islamic countries are not in there. Egypt, United Arab Republics, Saudi Arabia, and others are specifically excluded. So there is a rational basis on its face limiting the bans to areas that cannot be secured in terms of being able to check with any reasonable veracity and accuracy who you are letting in. One thing that needs to be kept in mind is it's an old and ancient principle of international law. It's been long sustained by the U.S. Supreme Court on many occasions that a country has absolute control over its borders. When you're at a border, the whole 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, do not apply order is looked at is so sacrosanct and imperatively important mm -hmm. to a nation that there is absolute control. Search and seizure does not apply. Generally, a lot of things don't apply. And one of the things that uh, you have to take into consideration is what happens if you as a citizen attempt to evade a border entry point. Well, that's a crime. Depending upon the circumstances, it may be a misdemeanor or a felony. Mm -hmm. So you can get in trouble. People get in trouble at airports by ditching uh, by direction or indirection customs. So what's good for the saw, sauce for the goose, rather, is sauce for the gander if it's an imperative for American citizens to cooperate with the rules and regulations at their own borders, then it certainly ought to be an imperative for someone who is not a citizen. Additionally, you have to look at this concept of reciprocity that is also an ancient tradition in international law. In other words, what one country, country does to its citizens uh, leads an expectation of it's to be all right for reciprocity to others. In other words, Mexico has a very tight border on its southern uh, end to deal with what is coming in from South America, Central America. So we don't have as draconian a set of border regulations as Mexico does when it comes to securing their own borders. Uh, I can remember a situation years ago, a uh, gentleman by the name of Macias, and he married and wound up marrying a black woman, but in the interest of third world, mm -hmm. he was trying to get some of us 
young brothers to go down to Mexico and work for the summer to mm -hmm. see what it was like. And I know there was a whole category of jobs in Mexico that you can't get unless both of your grandfathers were Mexican citizens. There are jobs you can't get unless both of your fathers were Mexican citizens. Some you can get if one of your father was a Mexican citizen. And some you can't get unless both of your parents were Mexican citizens. So they've had that long in place. So we don't have anything quite as draconian as they do. It's a matter of perspective. Mm. Now, I think the news media does a disservice to the public by neglecting to accurately and objectively report on certain things. And nowadays, instead of having an editorial to comment on what was reasonably objective reporting, the reporting itself becomes the editorial. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of misinformation that's thrown at us. We, by no stretch of the imagination, have the world's worst rules when it comes to on border control. We have some of the more lenient ones, but the law is the law, and if someone wants to become a citizen, there are methods that one can use to become a citizen. I'm aware of someone that was a housekeeper in California that I had. She went through the process, so she was a legal alien and one of her sons uh, had joined the local police department to secure his citizenship, and another had joined the Marine Corps as a method of getting citizenship. So some people follow the rules, some don't. And personally, since I have been in the position of ruling upon alleged violations of the law, I would say it is in everybody's best interest to follow that law. Uh, that's, that's good. I mean, like, to get this perspective for you is really refreshing because it seems like the media job these days is to get people in, into an emotional wreck. Like, you know, people's emotions are very all over the place. Uh, it's to well, stoke yeah. the fires of division and divisiveness. Yeah. See, what's happened is you have the LGBTQ crowd, and the femme crowd, has controlled the media for the last 45 going on 50 years. LGBTQ claims that 85 to 90 percent of all of the people that work in the Hollywood industry are charter members, so to speak, of their organization. And by that, I mean practitioners. So they have an agenda. And when something comes along or someone who comes along is anti the agenda or is perceived to be a block to the implementation of their agenda, then they attack that person or they attack the policy, and they are not a, they are not objective about it. Mm -hmm. The thing too that has come into play is political parties and sides of the equation, either the far left or the far right, have become quasi-religious to get people who need to belong to something and this, the world has become so much more tightly packed that there is less space. There are many more people, but instead of that bringing people closer, it has resulted in people being further apart from each other, but they want to belong. So people have a problem with a nebulous large entity is something they belong to, mm -hmm. whereas they might have a philosophical position that they identify with that gives them a sense of belonging. You have church members who feel like they're special because they belong to a certain church. You had the starter jacket phenomenon about 15, 20 years ago when all of the kids were wearing, uh, what is it, uh, Oakland Raiders jackets, and they yeah. didn't even know 
who was on the football team or even if it was an NFL team <laughs> for the most part. Right. They just wanted to have a semblance of belonging to something. Mm -hmm. So you get these kind of things, and when you get these kind of things, even every slight deviance becomes heresy or blasphemy, and you get uh, a reaction that is commensurate with that kind of view on things. So we have the media in the business of in being entertainment now. They get ratings. And once media went to 24-7 news, there not being enough news going on to merit that much attention on a station, on multiple stations. They compete for ratings, so they make it entertainment. So they try to appeal to a certain type of viewer based on uh, who or what the station is. Like CNN has their group they try to appeal to. Fox has their group they try to appeal to. And in between, you know, we get caught up in seeking news, but what we get more or less is a slanted worldview that is designed to push a cause. Yeah. Now, I will say this, the net does provide the same sources of information that are relied upon by the major news outlets to formulate their newscast. So we don't have to listen to that. We can get the same raw data that they get and make up our own minds. But essentially, we use the net for gossip and frivolity and gaming rather than for research and learning. So there you go. You know, I was thinking about, Judge, you were saying about the starter jacket phenomenon. I remember that when I was growing up. Also with the Jordans, but also now you look at the sports as like you know, like a huge Trojan horse of distraction with the LeBron James thing, the Lakers, everybody talking about uh, LeBron sexuals, and you know, everybody talking about sports where the, when Rome is burning, like things that are going right. on, and you talking about some damn sports and and and, and movies, and this is crazy, Judge. It's pandemonium. Somebody, yeah, somebody said, "How do you know all this about Judge? How do you know all these things?" Your memory is amazing. Well, yeah. I may have a good memory, but I spend my time dealing with these kind of things that essentially set the tone for your life, what's happening with your finances, with your kids, with the educational system, with the penal institutions, with uh, what you get for health care, what the parties are doing. That's what pays uh that's what I pay attention to. But some people, they can tell you the floor percentages of all of their favorite basketball players and do great analysis of everything from soccer to baseball. But they can't tell you anything about those things that impacts their real world other than what they believe. And what they believe does not have to be based on reality. I always tell people it's best to have no belief at all and only have opinions which can be modified upon acquisition of more reliable or more profoundly demonstrable fact uh, analysis or observation. So we get people believing things when they have no basis for the belief other than that somebody they think is reliable told them something. So are we heading for a, a literate society or a functional and literate society? I, is this the new dark ages where people don't want to research and learn how to comprehend for themselves? Well, one of the problems with that is education starts in the home. Mm -hmm. And in some homes, there's no basis upon which to start education. And you start noticing that these kinds of homes tend to be single parent, female head of household. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be female head of household, not where the woman got ambushed. That is somebody left her. That is where somebody died. Somebody divorced her. What happens is she didn't want to get married in the first place. And she's got five, six kids out of wedlock. She's not really capable of serving as a mother for one of them, let alone four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, or fourteen of them. And instead of having a situation where putative or prospective parents await until they become 
economically secure enough to have children, to have a single parent who had children in order to secure economic advantage. In other words, the more kids she had, the bigger her check. That's being cut back on in a number of states, but it still builds up habits that are out there. So the environment is one that's not a successful environment that's in the home place. The objectives in the home place are getting over rather than doing something. The objectives in the family are not about a cause, a big cause, uh, that the children can be introduced to and taught. It's about hustle. It's about getting over. And it's about survival in a world that is viewed as very much against the person in question. That attitude changes if a person gets a cause, even if it's only womanhood or manhood, because that means that the control factor that influences and establishes good behavior and good habits looks back at the person in the mirror every morning. And it's a question that is asked any time the person brushes their teeth, combs, or brushes their hair, shaves, or if it's a woman, puts on her makeup, and it's sort of, did you do what you were supposed to do yesterday? Are you going to do what you're supposed to do today? Hmm. So we get away from that. I sent you that thing. I don't Well, maybe I didn't see yeah, you know, it. With the whole post uh, thing, the, the drag queen, the 10-year-old drag kid, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that not disgusting? Man, it's, just, it's not, you know, it's not nature, it's nurture. They definitely trying to nurture a certain type of agenda for the future. Yeah. See, the kid is too young to know what sexuality is of any sort, mm. let alone sexuality between two individuals of the same sex, a.k.a. homosexuality. So he's sporting around like a drag queen, and somebody should have been teaching him from day one, you don't look like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have states like California that send home brochures telling the parents not to attempt to cause the child to have gender identification, but that's just a, a sneaky little thing because that's making the identification on the front end being ambivalent, which means you're supposed to be either bi or homosexual or a transvestite. So in other words, it sounds like it's being neutral, but it's not. Because children need to be acculturated for their appropriate roles in society. So they do not have that happen anymore in a large number of places because the acculturation is supposed to be neutrality, but that actually is not neutral. It you either teach the child to be what he's supposed to be or in not doing it, you basically teach him that there is no appropriate gender. And with no appropriate gender, they get into homosexuality, which is someone's First Amendment right to behave as. But uh, it's a matter of you may have a right, but maybe you've got an obligation not to exercise that right and do what you should do. So we have a limited pool of boys and girls from which to make men and women. But right now, we've got policies in place that are guaranteed to reduce the number of men and women you get out of that pool and produce something that's, well, I don't even get it sometimes. I, I'm not even sure they want to be called men and women. Right. Well, you know, I, what's interesting what you're saying, I'm thinking about the fact that if you got to recruit, if you can't reproduce and you must recruit, that means it must be an agenda. Because yeah, they can't, can't be reproduced. They got to recruit people into this t sort of thinking and lifestyle and culture. And then look at that sick 10-year-old running around like that. That's mm -hmm. disgusting. I mean, and look at this thing where they went off trying to talk about Bruce Jenner becomes Caitlyn and he's a beautiful <laughs> woman. No. That creature never was beautiful. <laughs> it was ugly. It was an it. If anything, it should have been like uh, an advertisement against drugs. You know, what was it? This is your brain on drugs. It should be, this is your face on Botox. Right. 
But you know they they question if Serena was a woman, but they saying that Bruce is Caitlyn is a woman. Bruce, it 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 look when you got a body and it's got male insides or female insides, it doesn't become the opposite sex just because you put on a cosmetic appearance. I don't care what the public, uh, the politically correct position is. Right. That's like one of these things that I think is absolutely horrible. You've got these failed boys who decide they want to be girls, so they get to compete in the girls' sports and they beat them. Well, hell, they're still uh, bodies with boy mechanicals and uh, quasi or faux girls' might. They shouldn't be allowed compete with the girls because that's not fair to the real girls. Mm. But they like it. And that's just, see, that's not mainstream society anywhere. That's this particularly little small group of people that has control of the media that wants you to think that way. And the rule on that one has been established uh, at least 80 some years ago when Joseph Goebbels, Joseph Goebbels, Joseph Goebbels, the uh, Nazi minister of propaganda, mm -hmm. came up with this statement. He said, a lie told once is a lie. Tell it a thousand times and it becomes the truth. Tell a lie long enough and loud enough and you can get anyone to believe it. And that's what's happened about a lot of this LGBT stuff. Now, it's their right to do it, but it's not the right... Uh, that should be exercised because that's saying you don't have to pull your load. See, part of this whole thing about masculinity has got to do with a standard of conduct, a standard of behavior and worldview that is inculcated, a culture uh, rated and socialized into, uh, into the child's head. So they do certain things. You don't hit women, you know, fight fair. You don't go take a gun and shoot up a schoolyard, or you don't take a baseball bat and go do that either, or a sword or a knife, or explosive, you see. That's a lack of masculinity, because masculinity is not the body. The masculinity consists of what's in the mind. So there is a, a, a movement that's been out there for 50 going on 60 years against masculine principles. No, so we need that brought back because a lot of this is just the product of sick thinking that's anti-woman, anti-man. Now, Joe, when you said that, I was thinking about the fact you talk about Joseph Goebbels, but also you think about the essays, the brown shirts of Nazi Germany who got Hitler into power. Yeah. These were a bunch of homosexual men, homicidal homosexuals yeah. that Hitler had to get rid of during the night of the long knives. He was yeah, afraid of them. He was afraid of them. <laughs> but these are the guys that put him yeah, in power. It was wrong. <laughs> yeah, Trump wrong. was in charge of that. Hitler himself had the pistol and kicked in the door of Rom's bedroom at a resort. And Rom was in bed with another man. Right. His chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> so so this like, we, he so, told him the German equipment, get out of the bed, get out of bed, you sick son of a bitch, you're under arrest. <laughs> So, but you also you got Nambla, right? South Park, the cartoon on Comedy Central made fun of Nambla, the North American uh, Man Boy Love Association. This stuff is very much real. This agenda. Oh, yeah, it is. And see, like you mentioned, you got to recruit. So, a lot of this so called neutrality is not neutral, it's a recruitment tactic. Mm hmm. But I think the parents of that, what is it, drag kid needs yeah. to be put in jail for child abuse. Are you Other things yeah. I didn't like. Uh, good brother, Lewis Hamilton, current world champion, mm -hmm. number one race car driver. Right. He ridiculed his nine-year-old nephew who came in with a, a, a skirt on dressed as uh, fairy queen or princess oh, or Lord. something. Jesus. And his sponsors <laughs> wanted to jump on him about it. 
So they made him do a Mia Culpa thing where they had him put on a Scottish kilt and apologize to his uh, nephew for telling that little fool the truth and telling, I don't know if his sister or his uncle, probably his sister, that let our boy come out looking like an abomination. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's sad, man. But I was all thinking about, Judge, you heard about the case of the, the 10-year-old boy who died from getting abused because he came out as homosexual. I believe he was 10 years old, and his family, I think his mom, and I don't know if it was his father or stepfather or this, his mom's boyfriend, allegedly abused him so bad he ended up dying from the injuries. Have you heard about that case? I, I don't know. That happens a lot. But yeah, that, he was 10 years of, old. Yeah. A lot of what you hear in the press or see on television is cherry pick. Mm-hmm. The stuff that they pick it out of is a big volume of it. It's just what happened to be at the top on a slow news day. All right. That's why I don't look at news. They're right to do it, but Mm -hmm. it's our right to say, no, that's not right. Yeah. And uh, in other words, it's their right to do what they do, but it's our duty to come back and say, you may want to, but that's not what should be done. So we can speak out, but now they've tried to make that a a bad thing. And I don't like this, this new developing trend of everybody's so damn delicate, like arresting somebody because he calls some cops Nazis, where the rule is, is original Fayette County Welfare League, heard by the Sixth Circuit, the judge was Bailey Brown, and he said, you can't charge anybody for use of language unless it was intended as fighting words. In other words, did it have the effect, the sole intended effect of causing the other person to want to fight? Mm. Oh, so that guy's some common sense. Top with, uh, <laughs> arrest folks for disorderly conduct, etc., mm-hmm. etc., et and all of the rest of it. Officer, did you want to punch him in his mouth? Well, no, sir. Did you want to hit him on his head? Well, no, sir. Did you want to kick him? No, sir. Did you want to fight? Well, no, sir. You want to take your gun belt out, punch it out, man to man? No, no, sir. Well, Your Honor, we move it be dismissed under the theory of the original Fayette County Welfare League. Case 1964. Mm. Well, common sense is prevailing somewhere in the country. But, like, what do you think about Supreme Court Justice uh, Kennedy's retirement, or Kennedy retirement, and people, like, were so outraged by it? I mean, he's, he's almost 90 years old. You know, does he have a right to retire from the Supreme Court and live his, you know, his last years, I guess, in peace and quiet? What's your take on that? What, on the Supreme Court situation? Yeah, with Justice Kennedy retiring. It is the first time, and you have to understand, Kennedy is not a liberal. Mm -hmm. Kennedy was looked at in horror when he got picked. Mm. Looked at as a very conservative person. Mm -hmm. He's the one that led the attack on affirmative action. He later qualified it, but, I mean, he's been no friend of black people particularly. Right. And Galea, the problem with Galea is no matter what somebody says about, oh, he's a great, brilliant jurist, or was, I say, well, read his stuff. And when they read it, I, I just feel bad. Why? Because I guess I'm not intelligent enough to understand what he was saying. It's not a matter of your intelligence. It's just what he was saying was bogus. Mm. Well, let me read it again. You know, I think you're right, Judge. You think you're right. Mm-hmm. That man... That is some wacko stuff. Yeah, it is. Mm. Wow. Well, you see, they have their myths. Mm-hmm. It's like there are a lot of myths. Uh, I'll slightly change the subject. One of the myths from the right wing is that there was an original intent to the Constitution, and it's a perversion for judges to try to change it and for judges to try to make law. Mm-hmm. Well, the very first case heard by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1792 Mm -hmm. was the matter of the Sixth Amendment that says no case tried before a jury upon the common law shall be heard upon appeal except upon the application of the common law. Mm -hmm. So the question was, case one, page one, what is the common law? The Supreme Court defined it interestingly and it said all law in the United States is common law 
are preceded by legislative statute, regulation, or ordinance. The common law, and this is a quote, is that body of judge-made law based on tradition, precedent, and the evolving conditions of society, unquote. So the very first case the U.S. Supreme Court had in 1792 was that, A, all law in the U.S. is judge-made law until a legislative body supersedes it. And B, most important for the discussion, it's supposed to evolve. So you have some ignorant, unlettered bozo who sits up there and says, it's an innate law, this judge-made law, when the original intent of the founders. Well, some of the people that were on the first Supreme Court signed the Declaration of Independence, fought in the Revolutionary War, or were very active in setting up the country in the first place. But, but anybody ought to know, they ought to, and they declared that all law is judge-made law until the legislative body supersedes it. And then, what's the next thing? It is that body of judge-made law based on tradition, precedent, and the evolving conditions of society. So they said it evolved. And then another very, very, very old case, Marbury versus Madison, was one wherein the U.S. Supreme Court said that the law, as interpreted by the courts, it can overrule a legislative act that the legislative act is unconstitutional. And that's very old. So those older clown types who run around pontificating wrongly don't know what they're talking about. Uh, we hear the international war on terror, war on terror, war this, fight terror. Well, there's no authorization to fight a non-sovereign entity anywhere in the Constitution, except one. Article 1, Section 8 says it's the obligation and responsibility of the naval forces of the United States to pursue, eradicate, and suppress piracy wherever found in the world. So, guess that means the SEALs were right when they take out bin Laden because you have another provision in there that says the supreme law of the land is the Constitution. Such laws as are promulgated to enforce the Constitution and those treaties that have been ratified by the Senate. So since there have been many treaties ratified by the Senate that declare hijacking airplanes to be acts of piracy, and uh, on 9-1-1 we had four aircraft hijacked, that's an act of piracy, and Article 1, Section 8 says uh, piracy must be pursued, suppressed, and eradicated wherever found. You've got anciently, right after the beginning of the 19th century, you have what the Marine Corps hymn celebrates as uh, to the shores of Tripoli. In other words, the Marines and the Navy going and fighting the Barbary and fight the Barbary pirates. So you still have piracy being fought off of the east coast of Africa right now because that's mandated by the Constitution. It uses the term shall. In other words, it's the imperative. Article 1, Section 8 also says that it is the duty of the commander in chief and the armed forces to, quote, enforce the law of nations, unquote. So all of the bozos running around talking about the UN and all of this, NATO, and we have no business doing this because it's trying to be one world government. Well, the very founding instrument itself, mm -hmm. not even an amendment, says it is the duty to, quote, enforce the law of nations. In other words, what would a civilized country do? So we get all sorts of deviations from that. But it is what it is. Yes, sir. That's why it's so important to have the alternative media outlets and platforms to get 
to get this type of information out there they won't get from uh so-called mainstream uh s- sources and whatnot so i'm glad and thankful just somebody with your type of background and understanding uh putting things in the proper context is accessible at this moment for our people well yeah on our last president obama barack obama came up with an idea and he signed an executive order that's an edict claiming to give the president the legal authority to order any person, including an American citizen, executed even inside the continental United States without any due process of law. A court enjoined him from doing that, but it got done anyway, so he should have been charged with... uh, a high crime or misdemeanor uh, while in office and impeached for that. I mean, as the judge says, uh, the Constitution and its amendments declared no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property except upon due process of law. How do you claim this? So the Obama administration said that was superior to the Constitution, which in the U.S., there ain't no such animal. So we've got lots of crazy things in there. Well, it's Obama. Well, he wrote the uh, presidential uh, executive order out and issued it, and it's still in force and effect. Trump can do it too. So in other words, you give somebody without any due process of law requirement to constrain what he or she does, can say, I don't like that, but that man says, I think he's a danger killer and mm. do it with impunity. That's what King uh, had done to him by J. Edgar Hoover with the FBI, but they had the decency to declare that kind of thing firmly illegal until we got the Homeland uh, Security slash Patriot Act after 9-1-1 that made it legal. So we've got a real mess. That's the scary stuff. I'm not wondering about a bunch of fairies running around and crazy folk acting like they lost their mind and uh, start talking nonsense, but I am worried about what's happening with the erosion of the law Mm -hmm. and the fact that people don't care about privacy anymore and having a clue what somebody says when they say this is Big Brother stuff. That's Orwell 1984. Mm-hmm. Not the book, but that's scary. Just the abysmal ignorance of the public. I mean, a lot of stuff that's clear to me. I learned in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, and I find here later on down the stream of time, so many Americans don't have a clue, and they've got the internet. But this is what I was talking about earlier about is this the new dark ages? Because you remember back in the middle ages, the only people that could really read and write were the elites. And the and the masses were given religion. They had stained glass windows that showed scenes in the Bible. But these folks could not read or write. But the people who had the power, they knew how to write. They knew how to read for understanding comprehension. But they, a comprehension, but they were the gatekeepers. So when people talk about the Illuminati now, I'm thinking they talking about these people that's well educated that run things, <laughs> not necessarily some well, boogeyman. I tell people that, Judge, what do I have to do to be rich? Well, you should stop thinking about being rich and start thinking about having a cause. And if you do mm-hmm. right, with your cause, the wealth will come. But first off, if you want to do anything, learn how to read, write, and speak. Mm-hmm. Communicate. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's why we got eubonics. No, eubonics is garbage. That's nothing. You see, there is a core fundamental language, and everything else is basically a a type of jargon, legal jargon, military jargon, police jargon, medical jargon, you know, stock market jargon, whatever it may be. It's just a specialization or a modification of the core language. So everybody in the world is using English now is the lingua franca law or the main language and now we're telling our kids you know learn robotics don't worry about learning english mm-hmm. what is that that's crazy mm. wow. and see being able to manipulate the language means that you can uh, in an articulate fashion state what you want 
and the way you state it may get it for you, wherein an inarticulate presentation won't. Mm -hmm. Plus, when you learn the language, it helps you in your thinking process. Yes, sir. So, man, thinking about what you were saying earlier, we got a situation where the public schools are demanding that people do this gender fluidity thing and do not dis, dis, you know, interrupt the process with your children, but the children not even getting any type of foundational learning at home. No, they're not. So you need to start putting a gender foundation in your kid's head. Mm -hmm. That is very important. Act like a man. Act like a woman. Act like a lady. Act, ladies don't do this. Ladies do that. A man does this, a man does not do that. And you keep putting it in the kid's head. Mm. Uh, you put that in the kid's head, they're going to grow up to be a man or they'll grow up to be a woman. Right. It'll yeah. be something that uh, everything they do is founded on, even if they don't think about it. Yeah, now, I, I, just, I, have, I have noticed something. And I think people are tripping. They're not realizing because they're really trying to get a woman in the White House by 2020. So I'm looking at all this so-called black girl magic in the politics right now. These upsets of New York, the black woman running for office down there in Georgia for governor. Where are the black alpha males in politics? Are they non-existent? <laughs> Is it like, there are no more alpha black males in politics? Well, see, here's what happens. The problem is that the black man in America has become a pressure relief device. Mm. Even if somebody wouldn't go out and physically lynch a black man anymore, mm -hmm. what happens is that they can scapegoat the black man vicariously and blame him for all of the ills that they're facing. So you don't want a black man in, and dear Barack really screwed it up for us because that was a golden opportunity for a brother to get in and just get all kinds of home runs like Jackie Robinson did and steal a home plate right. like Jackie Robinson did, to use a sports metaphor. Mm -hmm. But what he did is he just hit a bunch of zeros. So <laughs> all he stood for was for LGBTQ, uh, high finance, and uh, appearances. A chick click matinee star who did nothing. He sat there for eight years and there's nothing that came out of it except some legislation that he pushed that he didn't even draft mm. like Obamacare which if you get out into it is quite poisonous I mean it's the only thing out there but it's a Republican bill drafted by Tennessee senior Republican senator Senate Majority Reader doc, uh, Leader Dr. Bill Christ whose family founded Blue Cross Blue Shield and all these HMOs they're making a killing right but see, there's all this mythology out there, and that's a that's a shame because, like I said, people are so emotional. Even the men, they wear like feminine jeans, like tight jeans, skinny jeans. It's, it's just emo right now. Like everybody is like, it's like they're so suicidal. Like I want to talk to you about these rappers in particular, the one that got killed in Florida, the XXX Tentacion guy. Triple X. Yeah, Triple X. What are your thoughts about that? Because it reminded me of your case you had in your court. You talked about about the young black rapper who was taking care of his, uh, his female family members. Cause this guy yeah. was just 20 years old, but he brought four houses for uh, the black women in his family and left his mom in charge of his estate. Who's, who's not even 40 yet. I mean, she's a beautiful looking woman, <laughs> but she is left in charge of his estate. But I'm saying like, you look at him, he had, he had no father figure in his life. He kind of flamed out really early. So typically black women, the wrong kind, look at their sons and any male they run into as something to exploit. Mm. It's like I told that kid, his mama and his grandmama wanted his money. It's like, hey, if it wasn't for us, he wouldn't be here. Well, yeah, but you're not doing anything good for your son and your grandson. You just want to exploit him. Mm. So I took some steps to thwart that. They got mad at me, but now the boy who's grown man thanks me for it. Wow. So, man, you what, know, what if they got here to judge Joe Brown in his life then to help him out? He might not be dead right now. Might not be. Mm. See, but, oh my, see, and then we, that was a show we tried to start uh, a company I was with, and they didn't want any part of it. It was a, uh, 
outstanding athlete and his wife and what they were trying to do is take some of these black athletes or minority athletes and get them back on their feet after they had dealt with some unwise uh, things relative to their money and lost all of it. And invariably we found the big obstacle was their mothers. Mm. That's my money. What y'all trying to stop my money from coming? Because it's making your son broke, lady. You know, and he's not going to be any good to you after a while uh, or himself. You know, well, I ain't going to throw what he got me away. Or are you going to get some of back? No, I'm his mama. Yeah, well, you see, you're nothing but a parasite here. Most mothers in history would be glad to get their son someplace important or successful and leave it at that, not try to sit there and hold him back by exploiting his success, you know, that's wrong. But you know what? I think about that. You could, you compare and contrast the black athletes with the white ones. I don't see Tom Brady being pressured about his mama dream house. I don't see, you know, Peyton Manning or Eli being pressured about their folks' houses because they already got money. They also got fathers that were involved that provided for the family. So this is like a different situation when you look at some white athletes versus the black athletes. Yeah, well, it isn't all black athletes. It's just some mm -hmm. uh, who didn't have, you know, an effective, well-rounded family. Right. See, in other words... Like Kobe Bryant, he didn't have to have no pressure by his folks at home. Right. <laughs> it's always exceptions. Yeah. Well, yeah, but then you can look at his background. See, Kobe never went to college. Well, he was well, you would think he was well educated by growing up overseas and learning all the different no, languages? No, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. Okay. And he had some attitude problems. Like, all around the NF, uh, NBA, they said the Lakers had the best personnel, but they weren't the best team because of Kobe. He wasn't a team player. Well, they got LeBron now, right? You think things are going to change? <laughs> oh, let's see. They had Magic Johnson, but Magic Johnson said, we got to make it a team. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar came in and said, Well educated, right? Jabbar yeah. and Magic, that was a team. They couldn't block one without leaving the other open. The rest of the team cooperated. But, you know, when you got somebody like Kobe, it's give him the ball and you don't know when it's You just ain't a Kobe fan. You just don't care about Kobe. Practice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but see, like, I, I did the tip off in Detroit for the Pistons during the playoffs, too. Uh, consecutive years and they said you know the Lakers got more talent than we do but we're a team so we're gonna win and that's why they beat them they did yeah the five game sweep as they say <laughs> wow and they said you know the Lakers are more formidable and dangerous to play against when Kobe's sitting on the bench Man, fuck. a lot of Kobe fans ain't going to like that. I mean, but Lakers fans are interesting. They, they, they deserve to have, you know, win it like the Yankees. Well, you know, you know. Kobe's <laughs> character, Kobe's character came out in a transcript of his interview by the police in Colorado about that shaky rape case. Oh, yeah, Kobe. very shaky, yeah. And he tried to wheedle his way out of it by saying, you know, if you let me go, I can give you another player who's bigger than me. He said, well, who? He said Shaq. And the detective said, Shaq, Wheel O'Neal? He said, yeah, I can give you Shaq. Oh, my he God. Said, well, he, he done something wrong, too. So was any of it in Colorado? Well, I don't know. Well, we aren't interested. So, you know, a punk play like oh, that is ridiculous. Oh, my God. That's horrible. <laughs> so, you're talking about some man codes being violated. Lord, really? Yeah. <laughs> Little punks. <though. laughs> I don't know what he's got me. You see somebody. And he grew up with a father, though. He had a father in the home. He had a daddy in the home who was an athlete uh, himself, I'm, professional athlete. Well, uh, just because you, I mean, you, you need one there mm -hmm. if he's effective. But sometimes you just ain't effective. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. There are always the exceptions. Mm, that's true. An effective father is good for raising girls and boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, mother, I love my mama, yeah, but your mama's been the one who held you back. You know, Oprah likes to do that kind of thing where they 
have a show where they want to get the catharsis of the audience crying, you know, and they've got somebody with 14 children and, you know, or 11 children and uh, she's sitting up there whining and they're trying to get this boy who's rebelling against her to understand how much mama has done and how much she sacrificed and they want him to start crying and hugging mama and the truth of the matter is the mama was a hoe and everything that came in got given away to the latest boyfriend mm. so you know the boy wouldn't have been in that kind of circumstance that he was in if it wasn't for his mama being no good incompetent and incapable as a mother mm. You know, motherhood is a precious thing, but, you know, if you want the accolade, you got to give the performance. So I'm running into people that I've known for years now, and they have me because what to do, Judge Joe? What should I do, Joe? I said, well, what's going on? And then I find out what it's about. The granddaughter or the daughter or something is a real live clown. The one I don't like is you got three or four children, and mother hollering about, I'm young, I got a right to party. No, you don't have any damn right to party. You have a responsibility to be a mother. And when that's over, yeah, go ahead and do it. Well, yeah, when a little so-and-so gets big enough, he better bring mama some money. No, he doesn't need to better bring us some money. You need to understand that that child can do what is earned by you as the goodness of his heart may dictate. Otherwise, you keep your little filthy, grubbing hands out of his pocket. Hmm. Don't ruin that yeah. boy after you almost ruined him in life, but for the fact that he's got a talent. Hmm. I mean, you always talk about the brother did this, the brother did that, black man don't do this, black man don't do that. But I'm tired of listening to that. We go nowhere as a people until we get both sides of this equation together, the man and the woman. And the fact of the matter is, is this thing about black men never take care of the responsibilities. That's bull. Uh, every year I went to the judicial conferences, we'd have to go and get 16 unit hours a year. And that went on for at least 25 years before I stopped going. And every year when we got to the Guess what ethnic group paid their support more reliably and more on time than any other ethnic group? It's black men. Mm. But you know, the myth is we're just trifling. We never pay. Mm. Yeah. Well, speaking of, like, we want, we want change. We need to deal with real. Well, mm. speaking of black fathers, I just want to get your thought and uh, on the passing of Joe Jackson with your thoughts about him and his legacy. Well, <laughs> I think he did a good job, but his wife did. So his wife I didn't. Heard you heard say his wife heard. didn't do a good job. He did a good yeah, job, I but his wife didn't. English psychiatrist say all of this hoopla about what. Joe Jackson did wrong is just crap. He was no more strict, no less strict than any other father in history. And like he said, yeah, they wouldn't be going to the bank now if it weren't for it. Mm -hmm. The English shrinks had a, a different slant on it. They said what they saw was a mother who refused to discipline the children. So when they did something bad, they got the same thing they got if they did something excellent. And if they did something excellent, it was no greater reward than for doing something bad. So they grew up, screwed up in the head because of mama, because they had no perspective on I did right and I did wrong. Or I did good, I did bad. Hmm. So they don't get it. The Jackson family, and all of them are kind of screwed up. And that one little pervert who self-hated so much, he lost his nose from having had so many nose operations. He's got uh, necrophilia. He lost it. Mm -hmm. That's why he had to sleep in that oxygen tent trying to save it. Walking around looking like a zombie and then that sick perversion that he was talking about under the umbrella, there's nothing wrong. 
with a grown man being naked in the bed with a 10-year-old boy who's not his child. He said it. But they never could prove it Unless legally that he was a, he was a pervert, right? Of, uh, photoshopping and voice over. You know, that's the perversion right there. So, hey, you know, in my opinion, uh, the lowest people on the totem pole, not even murderers or any bad, are pedophiles. But to be fair to Michael, they could never prove legally that he was a pedophile. I mean, no, they could never. I'm just talking about what he said. Mm -hmm. There's a scene, it's, in, it's raining and he's under a black umbrella and he's... Uh, saying or protesting there's nothing wrong with a man being naked in a bed with a 10 year old boy even if the boy is not his relative if it's about love that's pedophilia I mean I would definitely not want to be in a bed <laughs> naked with a 10 year old boy I hear what you say <laughs> I don't even want to think of something like that but it goes, you think about the nimbler stuff though. Like you think about Hollywood they talk about me too but they're not talking about the pedophilia in Hollywood. They've been there for generations. Well, it's a sick institution. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's the one that's in charge of the information and entertainment for the world. Yeah, and you think about it, Michael, man, he's been performing. He was performing since he was six years old and hanging out with a lot of grown people, people older, way older than him. You don't tell them what went on in those parties. No, like, there's no know. telling what went on with them boys. Yeah, that's true too. I mean, all that is up. But, 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 but what do you think about the fact that we can't have no black male icons without some type of slander or type of dirt on, like upon their legacy? We can't have black, uh, masculine blacks, masculine blacks, right? Who are straight or yes. dangerous to that little cabal that runs everything in the entertainment industry? 